I'm Peter Hyde, the president of MetaStrategy, book author, Forbes columnist, and your host. I'm pleased to share this conversation with Atticus Tyson, the Chief Information Officer, Chief Information Security Officer, and Chief Fraud Prevention Officer of Intuit, the $6 billion financial software company. Atticus graciously shared his perspectives on a variety of topics featured in my new book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. The book's available now on Amazon or through gettingtonimble.com. In this interview, we dive into several of the book's themes, including people, technology, and strategy. Atticus discusses the importance of aligning technology strategy with business strategy and how having a strategic framework facilitates organizational agility. We also discuss how Atticus balances innovation with security in his role as CIO and CISO, how technology creates new opportunities for the business, and a variety of other topics. Stick around after the interview to hear more about the five themes of Getting to Nimble, or visit gettingtonimble.com to learn more. Our discussion began with Atticus's perspectives on the characteristics of a nimble organization. You know, what's interesting, and it may be that I have a biased lens, but I think being nimble kind of counterintuitively starts from having a framework. Or and, and it appears a little rigid, but I think, you know, at Intuit right now, we're kind of adopting our own version of OKRs. We're calling them outcome metrics and input goals. And we, as a company, since Sasan took over, he's instituted this, this meeting where once a month, all VPs and above in the company globally, we get together on a video call and we really go through outcome metric input goal by input goal. And we have aligned them to big bets for the company. And we basically scan down, everybody's expected before that meeting to put in an update for how they're doing, uh, red, yellow, green, some color, et cetera. And anything that's yellow or red, we talk about. And we say, what help do you need? And, and maybe it's not the right thing to go anymore. And I think the, the reason I think having a framework like OKRs or whatever you want to have is the, the biggest force against being nimble is confusion because you get different people going in different directions, thinking they're aligned, thinking they're working on the right thing, not from bad intent, but they're just not quite aligned. And seeking alignment is the thing that you need for speed and, and, and to be nimble. Because the other thing is, if you have a framework, if you have a set of objectives, sometimes we'll talk about an objective that is red. And collectively, we'll get to the point of, you know what, that one really should be read. And we should stop working on that, either because the hypothesis wasn't true or because something else has emerged and is more important. And so we really should say, okay, let that be read. In fact, everybody working on that, put it down and come over here because we actually really need help because something's working out well, but we want it to go faster. That can't happen if you don't have a framework. And, and so it's really important to use that framework but to not let it be in stone and to have it be a way to have a dialogue amongst the senior leadership in the company. So I think that's one really important thing. And I, that kind of spans people and, and process and strategy. But, yeah. you know, I, I really do think having some kind of visible alignment mechanism, you know, anchored in objectives and, and you know, progress metrics, if you will, whatever you want to call them. I think that's just super important. I was going to say, I, 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 as you say, that cuts across so many different areas in a really productive way that, that I'm interested in, you know, one of, the, one of which is actually the importance of strategy. So having like a, at the Sasan level, a strategy that, you know, sort of an enterprise level strategy, cascading that into the divisions of the organization, you know, making sure that that's filtering, obviously, to the actions of the initiatives that the different people are, are, are pursuing and that there's that line of sight between you know, from the work that individuals doing back to the, the bigger picture, so to say, but also speaks to the need for strong communications, that it's not just the CEO and the chiefs who understand this stuff, but that it filters through the organization so that people, you know, have that framework as a mechanism to understand, you know, I've got a new idea, well, maybe it doesn't fit, or maybe it does as a result of my understanding of, of that as well. So maybe I, I'd be interested if you could go back the onion a little bit on the on the strategy side of things. How is strategic planning from your perspective, if it has at all, how has it changed across your time as an executive, you know, given some of the differences in the way the business is done today, uh, different than from the past? Well, I, I don't know if necessarily, this may talk a little bit about how it's changed. I can talk about how we have done it for a little yeah, while. Yeah, that's great, that's great, exactly. And I think it works well, but which is, 
you know, we have an annual uh, retreat of the SVPs and above, probably yeah. about 20 people. Okay, yeah. 20 to 25 people. It used to be smaller. This year it was about 20. It used to be like a dozen, but mm -hmm. as we've gotten bigger, they've got more SVPs. But sure. what we've done, we have kind of a cadence where we'll step back and try to look at 10 years out, what are big, bold trends that are happening at that? And then, but we only do that about every three years at that retreat. And then in the interim years, we try to really say, okay, what are, what are the big goals for the company over the next 12 months? And so what Sasan has done as he's come in is he's declared five big bets. And then we, but we ground those in how they line up to how we serve customers. And, and, and I'll back up even further. At Intuit, we talk about employee, customer, shareholder, and in that order. And I do think that a lot of companies talk that way, but we really do live that way. And our belief is if we take care of the employees and we give them line of sight and give them clear objectives, they'll do the right thing for customers. And then if you do the right thing for customers, the right things for shareholders happen. And so one of the things we really try to do is steep everything we're doing from a strategy perspective in, well, how does it ladder up to our objectives for how we view, we want to exist in a community, how we want to help our customers, and so that our employees can kind of anchor their work against that. And so what, what Sasan did is he took over as CEO, he kind of looked and said, what are the big trends, again, with a small group of people, and declared these five big bets. And, and they were significant big bets for the future. And then what he's doing in this, in this monthly meeting where we're doing the alignment is those really do have to be aligned to those five big bets. And this is another thing about being nimble. When I talked about having that structure around the, the, o, the OKRs or the out, outcome metrics and input goals, they're not about operating the company. He relies on the SVPs and everything that to run the company and deliver current period results. These are about how are we moving into the future? And, and so that's another part of this, I think on getting to nimble is if you, if you ball operating the current company together with the strategy and try to run all that together, I think that's a mistake. And so I think you've got to empower your executives and your teams to run good strategy, to run day to day, but then use these kinds of OKR things to align the big work for the future. Because I think one of the things, and this is an art, not a science, I think when you're trying to put a goal cascading mechanism in place, you can try to get every person's individual objectives all lined up to that. And that just creates, actually that creates the opposite. It creates a log jam. What you really wanna do is at what level, you figure out what's the right level to kind of have that alignment stop and, and, and to kind of be at a strategic enough level that we're aligned, but not so de detailed that it just creates paralysis for everybody trying to overline. And so strategy kind of informs the biggest company-wide objectives you're gonna want senior leadership aligned to. And I think it's a little bit separate from day-to-day -day operating the company, but you know they can't be so disjointed that you, you know, you're operating off in one direction and your strategy is this way. Yeah, that makes sense. I like the way in which you frame that. And essentially, that gets translated in some ways through to you know how each each different part of the organization is going to enact the big five, presumably, right? Because yeah. they, they'll have different ways, different levers they're pulling based upon the disciplines that they, that, that, that are, you know, that mark their, their part of the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Makes sense. Well, why don't, if you don't mind, I would love to get your thoughts about security a topic that you're immersed in now and have been for some months. Uh, and, and we're obviously very much involved in before taking on the current role as CISO. T talk to me a bit about, you know, how you've oriented yourself and your team you know, to make sure that you are, again, forgive my, I don't want to overuse the term, but that you are nimble when it comes to addressing threats proactively, like both playing offense and defense, you know, how you think about organizing, you know, the enterprise as a whole towards, towards security and so forth. Yeah, a couple of things. And, and now that I've been in a couple of months, I'm a complete expert. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so this is the right answer. <laughs> exactly. So take this for what it's worth. I'm still learning a lot, but, but what I'm finding is we're already starting to make some changes. What I think we're finding is, as we find pockets of information that we have about adversaries, about at bad action that are happening, we're trying to bring that data into view better in a way that can be shared by other teams. Because what we're finding is, we've had instances where one team knew about a group of bad actors that were testing 
their exploits against us. And had we shared that knowledge across, when those same bad actors were ready to do a bigger exploit, we would have been better prepared to defend. And that's not to say we didn't get, you know, we didn't get infiltrated or anything else. It's just we would have had a much better time defending against them. And so what we're trying to do now, and I think this leads to being nimble, is create, we're creating a platform whereby all of these signals can be made available to all of the teams. And, and we're also trying to bring fraud prevention and cybersecurity together because there's more commonality than difference that I found. Because in a way, a bad actor is a bad actor. And they might be using cybersecurity breaches to really perpetrate fraud. And at the end of the day, they're all either after money or fame or something else, but they're doing different techniques. And fraud and cyber are very related. And one of the things we've had as a company is those have been pretty separate. And so as I'm bringing them together, people are beginning to realize they are tracking similar signals. So from a nimble standpoint around security, I think one is get all the information available and visible for the different teams. And to help the teams that are fighting against you know, bad actors realize they're all fighting the same fight and they're not fighting each other. But the other thing is, as you begin to bring all that data together, you can bring much more modern techniques like you know, data models and uh, machine learning models and, and bring much better you know, augmented visibility into what's happening for the humans that are beginning to try to find that fight. And so we're, we're really beginning to find some great success where we're training models on a much larger data set. And so the models are becoming more predictive, uh, more accurate, faster. And then we're beginning to let the models actually some start to make some decisions, which we really weren't able to do when we had that siloed data set, because each group kind of had too small of a data set to, to make good decisions. So that's that's one thing. I think another thing is the way we divide it up is we do have the name we're calling it now is kind of an adversary management team. Like their job is focusing on learning all they can about all of our adversaries and populating all of that in to that data set I talked about later. There are other teams which are beginning to manage the, the risks. And one of the things I find that's difficult for our organization at least is the teams that are finding risks and the teams that are managing the risks think about them differently. And if those two teams are not clear on what their role is, it can create a lot of tension. The team finding risk wants every risk to be closed. The teams that are trying to manage risk are running a business. And there are some risks as a business you want to tolerate because the, only, the best way to have no risk in a business is don't do business, right? <laughs> and, and so it, you've got to really empower the people who are running a business to make risk-based decisions informed by the others. So helping with that clarity of who's on what side of that risk equation is another thing that we're trying to strive for, which I think will speed up how we operate. Let me ask you, I... CISOs have historically, you know, let me paint with some broad brushstrokes here. CISOs have often been viewed as kind of, you know, the the counterbalance to innovation, if you will. They're they're the governors that are in place. It's the risk managers as opposed to the risk, you know, innovation, as you point out, uh, you, all of business to some extent, but certainly innovation is about risk taking. But then you go to CIO. CIOs also historically, now much less so, thankfully, but historically have been viewed as you know, the no in innovation to some extent and, and you know, more tactical organizations or leaders of organizations, historically I'm talking about now. You came to first the CIO role and now, of course, to the CISO role, having been in a product role. So you understand, you know, you understand before you get to these positions, how value is created at a fundamental level within the company. And I know, of course, from our past conversations, that colored the way in which you view the role of CIO and the role of IT. And actually, you know, also, as you and I have talked about, I've, I've been able to, as a modest person that you are, I've been able to brag uh, for you in mentioning to others that I think you're one of the early people to really draw insights. The others are now following in your wake in terms of developing this product orientation with, re with regard to the IT um, department. Now, now going into an even more historically tactical organization within the, or, the the company, I wonder, is there a similar kind of filter you're bringing to that? As you, I, I'm not asking you to throw any predecessors in the CISO role under the bus. Is there a different way you think about things likely than they did, just given the difference in, you know, difference in orientation from your past positions than they, than they would have had prior to becoming CISOs themselves? Yeah, I mean, it, it's possible because I do think a lot of, there's actually 
a lot of commonality and, and a few differences. I think yep. a lot of the commonality in IT, CIO, and security, CISO, is they are really enabling functions and they're really there to enable a business to operate. They're there to advantage a business. They're not there to do the business. They're there to advantage a business. And I think one of the thing, ideas we brought to the IT group was our job is to advantage into it, you know, to compete. And I, it's something I've been talking about recently and see how this resonates with you is I think as a CIO, my job is to create a cone of optionality, basically around the business. And what I want to do is create enough variability in the technology that I've given the business that if they decide to move left or right, or they move a little faster, that my, the tech is ready to do what they want. And I've succeeded if I don't limit them from making a decision that is kind of a, a logical, but maybe a little bit of a leap from where they are. And that's that cone of optionality. If the business makes a complete left turn and I wasn't ready for that, I think that's okay. Because that, that would have meant I would have wasted a lot of resources because I would have had to have widened out that cone of optionality way so, so far because it's expensive to have a cone of optionality. And so I think that's a way I've been talking about the role of the CIO recently is our job is to create that cone of optionality and to have a dialogue with business leaders about how wide you want that to be and how deep you want it to be or how far out you want it to be. And so then you kind of know the playing field of where the business can move around and where you're investing to make that happen. Because one of the things that happens in IT organizations is they get disappointed when the business changes their mind. Like we've been investing in this thing in this way and then the business changes and then we get frustrated with them. What we have to realize is that's the way business works, is they're, they're, they're out there chasing things. And so if we've agreed on, look, this is, our, this is our area of optionality, and if they're making decisions in there, great, we're happy. We've done our job. We don't need to be involved in those little changes. But if we need to significantly move that cone of optionality, that's a, then a deeper dialogue, which requires some investment. I think a similar thing exists on the, on the security side. We need to create a cone of security. And we need to create optionality there and a cone of risk, maybe is, maybe is a better way to think about it. I may be overstretching the analogy, but it's a cone of, of risk and risk tolerance. And what we need to be able to do is, again, inform the business of this is the risk we're taking as a business. And do we want to take that much risk? And what are those risks? And how do we have a thoughtful dialogue about that? And if we invested money, this is how the risk would shift and move. And if we don't invest money, this is where the risk is. And are we okay with that? Instead of trying to say, well, look, you just have to invest in security because, you know, otherwise you're going to get breached or, you know, you're going to go to jail as an executive. And those kinds of scare discussions just aren't helpful because they're not really rooted in being able to make some decisions. And I think it's, I think both roles, CISO and, and CIO, are really about having a thoughtful dialogue with the business about optionality and about where to invest. Yeah, I really like that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, great overview. One of the things that in obviously the last one there is like security and business continuity and disaster recovery. The ones above it, maybe not systems availability quite so much, but all the other ones I see as having profound impacts on, on security. You know, having well-articulated enterprise architecture means that you kind of understand what is where and why and how it's changing as you're bringing new new ideas or new products. And certainly the way in which you leverage the cloud can and who you choose to do it with will also have some implications as to how much risk you're taking on. You know, developing microservices and, con and using containers as a means of having a more flexible infrastructure, but also containing issues to some extent. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, you'll forgive me, on topics that you can probably go a lot deeper on than I can. And then finally, the retirement of the old. You know, there are a lot of organizations that are very good at bringing in the new and not so good about rendering the redundant, you know, retired. And so anyway, I, I'd, I'd be curious, you know, you don't need to cover all of those. I don't know if you have any perspectives on, on any of them. And especially if you've got any fresh insights as a result of your current, the chair you currently sit in, I'd be, be interested in your perspectives there. Yeah, a, a, a couple of things. I mean, I think the dialogue around security is in some ways a little bit like the dialogue around quality was years ago, where you can't test quality in, you can't, you know, through policies and, and you know, mandating, you can't mandate security in, you have to design it in from the beginning. And, and I really do think there is something to, and I'm still learning and thinking about it, but I really think there is something to designing security in 
to your your organization, your product, your service. And, and again, back to the role of the CISO, absolutely the role of the CISO is to ensure all the right things there are to protect the organization and the right frameworks and all of that, but ultimately to drive upstream to figure out how do you design that in so that you don't have to have such huge defenses on the outside. And, and that's a part of that I'm still trying to figure out where to go with that. But I, I do think it does start with architecture. It does start with even how you organize, because how, where do you have security people? Do you have security people or is everybody a security person? And there's the, the whole thing of, well, if it's security is everybody's job, then it's nobody's job. And there's all those, yeah, there's all those yins and yangs and they're all true, but, but you got to figure out for each organization, how do you drive that further back up so that it is really by design. Everybody is thinking that through and, and, and you can imagine the enterprise architecture side of it is interesting too, because th there's a concept that I'm still learning about of the observer and the observed. I don't know if you've heard this paradigm, but is the observed is kind of your product and your service and everything else. And then there's a set of observer technology, which is looking at how that's operating and is trying to say, are there anomalies happening? Are there attacks happening? And you want to make sure your observer can't get compromised. And so you want to think about that differently. And there are some, again, design decisions of, do you think it back to the cloud point, do you think of having your observer technology in a whole different public cloud than your observed technology? Mm -hmm. And so again, that's all early design kind of thinking. And I, I think modern companies are going to have to start thinking about this and have to be investing in, okay, I'm going to build my product, but now I'm, how do I make sure it's really secure? How do I want to think about that? And it's not through just pen testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's very well said. I wonder also, I, I, may I assume that you've gotten involved in DevSecOps, introduced that into the organization. Can you maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, in, in layman's terms, the way in which you've thought about the kind of implementation of that and, and how it has evolved since its introduction? Yeah, I, I, I can talk mostly from just beginning to understand how we're doing it at Intuit. It's been something yeah. that I'm not as deeply involved in yet, but I think the, as a company, we're, we're somewhat evolved where we're building a, a secure software development lifecycle where as a developer checks code in, in addition to obviously all of the quality checks that would get run, there's a whole bunch of security checks. And we're really now trying to get to the point where from when you check code in to when it can be published out, that's a shorter, a shorter road as possible, but that it really does go through a set of quality and security checks. And that those are both static and dynamic and everything else you would want. And so that that whole pipeline is really just, it, it's, it's one continuum. It's not that security is out on the side. And, and I think we are as a company, the problem we have as a company and others like us is because we have legacy stuff, because we're an old company with layers of technology, you can do a great code pipeline with your new stuff, but all your old stuff is still getting updated. And that's where your vulnerabilities lie. And so thinking DevSecOps for new stuff, fantastic and beautiful and easy. But how do you think about the older stuff and bring that in? So that's one of the things we've been trying to focus on is how do we bring some of the goodness of some of our, our pipeline tools back to some of our older technologies? And we're just beginning to think about it. But I, I do think it's something that we're trying not to reserve it just for the new stuff. Yeah, got it. Can you talk a little bit about how you think of change management? You know, as you're introducing new disciplines, is change management like what you described with regard to security, something that's baked in as early as possible to the plans? Are there specific people that are, that are responsible uh, or is it everyone's responsibility? And how you think about the process that guides it? Yeah. So on the IT side, we definitely have people whose job it is to think about change management. And whether we're implementing a new, you know, uh, expense management system or a new collaboration system, from early on, we have a track of work always on a project, if it's big enough, that there's a change management track. And, and change management is not only just how you train people, but it's really how you win their hearts and minds to like the new thing, because change is hard for a lot of people. And so we start to think about campaigns we want to use to do that. And it goes to everywhere, everything from you know, having some early adopters who begin to trumpet it, so it's not you trumpeting it, and you know, how do you begin to do all these kinds of things. So IT, we've, we've, we're pretty good at that. On the security side, we don't yet. And I do think we, we need to do more of that. I think the security team has been thinking of itself more as, hey, it's our job to bring up awareness and to train everybody. And that's 
I would say stage one out of about five on change management, which is what we really need to do is get people's hearts and minds over and to get them pulling some of the change instead of us pushing it. It's great change management is when your users are pulling it. And so we, we are not there yet, but it, we have to be. I think there's a lot of similarities between CIO and CISO. And, and I do think the CISO teams are, you know, they're not resisting it, but I think, and again, I may be just, I have this unique vantage point, which I got to go product CIO, CISO. So I kind of get to see how that they're all more alike than they think they are, <laughs> but is just the, the CISO organizations, I think can learn a lot from IT organizations, but they're also a little bit hesitant because they view themselves. I was going to say this earlier. They really view themselves as the protectors and, and they protect people from doing stupid things. And, and, and I think if you're, if that's your mindset where you're trying to protect the organization from itself, I think that's a really difficult spot to be in because it puts a big weight on your shoulder as the, as the cybersecurity team that you've got to really be that last bastion of defense. And some of that has to be true. And, and then this is where I'm new enough in the role. I'm probably overstating it and I'm probably underestimating the nuances, but I think that is a problematic way to think about it. I think it, a much better way to think about it is we're here in, in it together. Let's characterize and describe the risk and then have a thoughtful dialogue on risk that we're taking on jointly, you know, that, more of that kind of dialogue. And I, I don't find that dialogue in security organizations very much. They're much more about, you know, we need to protect, we need to close off, we need to do this. They're coming from a place of no. And, and I, I found in the IT organization when I started, that's kind of where it was as well. And it's not out of bad intent, but it is about, uh, wow, if I don't say no, such a bad thing is going to happen. And so I have to. And I don't like being the no-sayer, but I have to. And so we, we need to kind of get them seeing a different way that they can actually still protect the organization. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, then back, back to your thesis on the book is enable nimbleness. Because you know, no, no is just like a, it's, it's a break. It's a friction. And, and, and so how do you, in a way, get the same outcome with less friction? Yeah. And, and that's kind of a thing to maybe even measure, which is the amount of friction in an organization. And, and a lot of that must boil down to like effective communication and education. You know, each discipline is expert in something different from the others. And somebody like you, of course, has been expert or has had reason to develop expertise in multiple disciplines. But, you know, there are obviously there are others that you've not. And, and there are people there that have those. And so, you know, there ought to be a role of kind of each educating others, at least with especially where, where the intersections are, so that everyone has at least a degree of knowledge and understanding and awareness so that such that you're making these decisions together. You are not kind of, you know, keeping people out on an island, you, you know, in a sort of a risky situation that you're kind of walking shoulder to shoulder forward with a common understanding. Is that, I mean, especially from a security orientation, I have to imagine that's true, right? I, I totally agree. But I also think that that feels very scary to security professionals ah. because they feel like if they do that, they're going to be back to that observer observed thing, right? If they get too close to the business, they'll lose their uh, objective objectiveness. They'll lose their ability to do their job. And yeah. that may be true. I don't know that I'm educated enough to definitively say they shouldn't, but I do know there's something there that it's not, the, the balance isn't right. Makes sense. Do you, have, do you have any thoughts on, from a knowledge management perspective, you know, it strikes me in this day and age, it's so important that we not reinvent the wheel. And there's so much in any, any you know, large going concern, there's been a lot of thought put into almost anything and the ability to go back and understand like how high have we gotten in this discipline such that I can actually climb on top and build from there, as opposed to believing that I'm at you know, ground zero when the company is beyond that. Any, any thoughts on the way in which knowledge is managed to make sure that people are not sort of, as I say, kind of doing rework when it's not necessary? Yeah, it, <laughs> it it's very front of mind for me right now because, well, this is maybe an interesting angle. Part of the part of the things to think about is at what level on the hierarchy of going from data to information to insights that you make it broadly available. Because I think one of the things that I found is a lot of teams would love to share their insights. <laughs> they not necessarily want to share the data naturally organizations tend to want to, you know, say, well, we believe this, 
It's like, well, where's the base data for that? And I think one of the things we're trying to do at Intuit, and I suspect other companies are as well, from what I've heard, is go further back down that hierarchy and make the data more visible to everybody so other people can make their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I, now to what I'm specifically trying to do at Intuit is, yeah, we had a red team, which was looking at adversaries and they would track things and they would have a repository. And then we had a fraud team over there doing their stuff and they were kind of sharing and they'd call each other up and talk about this. It's like, no, no, I want all your base research in one repository. And then I want all of you to have access to that. And then I want to bring in the data models to have access to that as well. And then you can all share your insights into one common place. So get the data visible, get the insights visible, but don't create these funnels out of these organizations where all you have in common are the insights because then you get really false conclusions. Yeah. And so I think that that is a kind of an interesting framework to think about, which is how do you go all the way back down just to make the raw data available? Because as a, I, I think modern nimble companies strive for that. And, and so may, maybe even to add some interesting things, if you have a structure where all the data is visible and you encourage people to root around in the data and have insights, they can have the framework in which to work, which is the OKRs, and they can everybody can bring their unique insights because we're all hiring diverse workforces that have different points of view, that they can see that data in different ways. And so if you're, if you're making the data available, but not the insights, that all can be a nice positive reinforcing loop. Hmm. Maybe. That's really interesting. No, I do like that. I appreciate you, you, you raising that. I'm also all curious, you know, an organization like Intuit has a, well, every company has a unique culture. Intuit has been called out though, one is having a strong one. And I'm curious as somebody who's been immersed in it for so long and contributed to it, now as a leader of the organization, what insights do you have about how one thinks about culture, how one documents cultural attributes, how one uses that for recruiting or evaluation of talent? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting. I, I think culture is something that you have to actively cultivate and you absolutely have to, you have to nurture it. You have to, you have to shape it. You have to shape with it. You know, it, 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 it's a real thing to be talked about because if you don't, it exists and now you're blind to it. I think one of the things we've been very thoughtful about it and to it is trying to distill our culture into a set of values that we actually make visible. And, you know, lots of companies are value driven and have value. So it's not unique to us. But we try to reinforce them in everything we do. We try to have specific language that we get everybody to use, and that drives commonality. And so, that, again, it drives a sense of we're in this together, we're one team, we have a common purpose. Uh, and I think that's a lot of what a culture gives you is a, you're part of a team and you're part of a, a common purpose driving toward that, that goal. And, and I do think that when a company writes down its values, it's doing kind of a nuanced thing between, you know, noting down what its culture is, but also trying to shape its culture. And you, you, short culture, you can't shape that often. And so I think we've only done our values in our 36 year history twice, maybe three times is when we've really kind of taken a hard look at our values and adjusted them. They're not something that change dramatically uh, and quickly, but you can't just lock them in stone and say they're that forever because I, I just think, I don't know of any company that's had the same values for, you know, over a hundred years. Maybe they are, but I think it's tough. Yeah. No, that makes sense as well. One other thing I know is people, we talk to recruits and we ask them, you know, after recruiting kind of questionnaires and it comes up, you know, culture comes up as something they're looking for. And I think, I think that's different than it was 10, 15 years ago. I do think recruits now, and not even just early career recruits, I think mid-year recruits, you know, end of, end of career recruits that's something they all think about now. I think it started with early career, but now it's, it's moved through the whole population where people really do think about that. Yeah. Are there any differences, speaking on recruiting for a moment, any differences in the way in which you think about recruiting now different from a decade ago? Or, I mean, I'm asking at a very unusual time, of course, where, you know, two months ago that we had the lowest unemployment employment rate of yours or my life. And now that's very different. So we're going to be going from a a seller's market to a buyer's market from a talent perspective. So I, I recognize that in some ways, you know, what you have for your for a lo long stretch for both of us as 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 people who hire people, a, a set of attributes, a set of you know principles that that are now going to be changing. That said, 
you know, are, are there differences in the, the, the methods you use, what you look for, how you think about, you know, filling different roles, uh, different, from, you know, a decade ago or so? Yeah, this, this may be a very interesting area. What we do, we've created our own process. We call A for A, assessing for awesome. And we use the numeral four in the middle. And, and the way we do it is we really strive to make a decision on a candidate in one day. And because candidates appreciate the speed. And so the, the general way we do it is the hiring manager will create a, you know, a slate, if you will, two, three, four candidates for a role and get that teed up before we run them through the A for A. And then we try to run everybody through the A for A quickly. And if, if you can hire two or three people, great, you'll hire two or three, but if you're only hiring one, you try to make the decision within a few days so the candidates don't have to wait. And the way we do the A for A is it starts off with a craft demonstration which a lot of people do, but we do it for everybody. I'm actually hiring a new VP and I was just telling him uh, yesterday about the craft he's gonna have to prepare. And what, it's, it's a scenario. We, we say, here's a scenario for you and how would you solve it? Or if you're an engineer, here's a coding problem. So the craft can differ. If you're a designer, you know, it's a, it's a small design project we might give you. And we basically have you present that in about two hours to your interview panel. And we also keep the interview panel down to four, five people. And the interview panel, by the way, is not your hiring manager. It's a group of people. And you'd spend two to three hours in that craft demo, kind of presenting out, talking. They may ask, ask you questions. We try to not make it be solving just for uh, extroverts. So we try to kind of make it so that introverts can, can do well at it as well. But after that, then you have an, a one-on-one -on -one interview with each of your interviewers, the four to five that afternoon. And at the end of the day, if you're the only candidate and it's a yes or no, you're, you, you know, they do a debrief at the end of the day, they say yes, and the hiring manager calls you and you're hired. And so that, in a way, sets up from the beginning, speed, nimble, et cetera. It sets the tone for who we are as a company. And the candidates feel like they, they appreciate it because we value their time. And we found that having 10 person interview panels, et cetera, it does not increase uh, the outcome. Uh, because we've honed this over time and we would have studies where you know we do a six month out a survey of managers who hired candidates, how did they work out? And then a year out. And we did with A for A and without A for A. Without, with A for A, tremendously better than, than the old way of doing like 10, 10 interviews over two weeks and all that. And so what, what I like about the talent thing is we're looking for people, not just who know what we need them to know today, but we're looking for people who think about problems in a certain way. They think broadly, they bring the other disciplines in, they're, they're nimble in their thinking, they're broad in their thinking, and they're not just like a specific expert in one craft. Because I think one thing different now about companies from 10 years ago is if you have a bunch of specialists as a company now and you need to change direction, that's really hard. But if you have a bunch of people who are broad thinkers and good problem solvers and, and work collaboratively, then you can go wherever you want. And, and so I think that's one of the things that, and, and that's not unique to Intuit. A lot of people are talking about trying to hire this way, but I think our A for A process really does kind of look for that. I like that. That's really great. Great insights, as always, really great insights across this. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This interview featured insights that you'll find in my upcoming book, Getting to Nimble, How to Transform Your Company into a Digital Leader. In an era of unprecedented technology progress and disruption, it's imperative that companies transform themselves to keep up with their digitally native competitors. In Getting to Nimble, I explore how companies, including Capital One, FedEx, CarMax, Domino's Pizza, The Washington Post, Walmart, and others, have modernized their practices related to people, processes, technology, ecosystems, and strategy. And I provide a framework for companies looking to do the same. To learn more, visit gettingtonimble.com.